The title of the paper is Unloading NPLs, Unlocking Credit Evidence from the ECB Provision Guidelines to Co-Journalists. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for um, um, giving us the opportunity to, uh, to present this uh, paper here today. And thank you very much for making uh, the time and effort to attend this very last um, uh, paper in, this, uh, in today's session. So the paper uh, is uh, co-authored with uh, Soner Baskay at the University of Glasgow, who is uh, with us today in the audience. Uh, also with uh, Jose Gutierrez and Jose Maria Serena, both at the Bank of Spain. So what we, um, what we try to do in this paper is to <clears throat> explore the idea that uh, unloading uh, bad loans, non-performing loans, might have an effect on the, <clears throat> on the credit supply. And we look at specific <clears throat> policy change that was introduced by the European Central Bank. So <clears throat> let me start with a little bit of uh, background and motivation. So what, <clears throat> what is generally um, well known and accepted in the literature is that um, during previous financial crisis and ex extreme events, as well as the, uh, in the most recent pandemic, um, banks um, accumulated a lot of bad loans, these you know, non-performing loans. Uh, but the accumulation of these bad loans on, on, on their balance sheets had negative effects, not only on the, on the financial stability overall, but it, it you know, affected the, the, the ability of the banks to originate loans and in generally harmed uh, economic growth. So for these reasons, uh, supervisors, and well, the fact is that you know, during this period, and especially after the sovereign debt crisis period, uh, banks, had, banks had an incentive uh, not to get rid of these bad loans. Instead, they, they may have, you know, they have some discretion and they may decide to keep these loans on their balance sheets, um, simply because recognizing these loans uh, would potentially uh, harm their you know, profits, at least in the short run. And, and for this reason, regulators and supervisors have every incentive to keep a close eye and monitor the disposal of the, the, how the, how the non-performing loans are managed and the potential disposal of the, of the loans. So in light, in light of these concerns, um, we, we actually um, witnessed the European uh, authorities undertaking different initiatives, different steps in order to address this problem of non-performing loans, as I said, especially in the aftermath of the sovereign debt crisis when several countries uh, in the European, um, in, especially in the periphery, they accumulated large stocks of non-performing loans. The idea behind these initiatives would, you know, simply strengthen the, uh, the, the, the NPL supervision and <clears throat> trying to, uh, to, to uh, fix uh, uh, damaged uh, balance sheets. So, uh, excuse me, despite the importance uh, of these policies, despite the fact that these policies actually can help uh, not only banks, but also policymakers uh, to make steps about the resolution of non-performing loans, there is very little evidence about whether these um, uh, policy initiatives are A, successful in reducing NPLs, and B, whether they can improve ultimately bank lending. So motivated by this apparent gap in the literature, uh, what we intend to do is to, to analyze the, the impact of changes, specific changes in the provisioning requirements of non-performing loans uh, that was introduced back in 2018. And, and to do so, we will uh, rely on very you know, rich, uh, detailed data from the Spanish Credit Registry, looking at the universe of loans uh, to non-financial firms, and then we will match this with, uh, with firm uh, bank data. So very briefly, because I'll uh, explain in more detail what this policy um, is about. Uh, what we are looking at here is that uh, the, the, the ECB um, and Carad's Bank, they published concrete requirements and, um, and policy guidelines. 
uh, in order to increase the provisions for non-performing loans. So banks had either to comply or explain, so supervisory expectations uh, were formed, uh, as, especially with regard to the disposal of, of, of non-performing loans, and, and in particular, the, um, the ability to collateralize and, um, and also the, the time that a loan has been uh, has remained as, as NPL in, in, in the bank's balance sheet, which we call vintage. But as I said, I'll, I'll go through the, um, the policy in more detail later on. But the, the, the objective that we have in this paper, the main aim of this paper, is to examine whether following the policy, this you know, policy intervention, these changes in NPL oversight had an effect on the probability to dispose loans, uh, Second, whether this had an effect on the supply of credit. And finally, we'd like to find out whether these changes also had some real effects, whether, for example, firms, you know, real outcomes were affected by these, um, by these uh, change. So um, very quickly, and trying to uh, preview our findings, um, what, we, what we show in this paper is that the introduction of this policy was effective. So, you know, it affects the bank's propensity to dispose of bad loans, which is good news and in line with our expectations. Um, we find that the banks that are more heavily exposed to the policy, they end up uh, tightening their, their lending and they require high levels of collateral. And we, we also find that not all banks are affected in the same manner. So apparently a, a more profitable banks are, you know, able to smooth the, the shock, and not all firms are affected in the same uh, manner as well. Not, not all firms are affected proportionally, with risky firms being affected the most. Um, when we take the analysis at the firm level, and uh, we, we try to, to find out whether firms have had any, uh, any effects, uh, we, do, we do show that for those companies that they borrow from banks with older NPLs with, you know, older vintage NPLs. Um, for, for these companies, you know, these companies experience a decrease in the, you know, overall borrowing, in the, you know, sales, uh, employment, investment, and other, and other activities. And once again, the effect appears to be more important for the uh, risky group of firms. All right, so um, very briefly, the literature, uh, uh, well, actually, we touched on three different strands of the literature, but it's, it's, it's very well developed uh, in, in the, in the non-performing loan literature. Um, we, we can summarize a bunch of papers that, you know, they try to identify the drivers behind NPLs, and, and they mainly concentrate on the adverse macroeconomic conditions and other bank-specific uh, characteristics. There is also a line of work which shows that the high, you know, high level, high stocks of NPLs tend to reduce lending. Um, however, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's you know, increasingly difficult to identify this uh, causally, you know, in the absence of some uh, you know, uh, proper control or quasi-natural experiment. And, and more recently, attention has focused to more granular data that you know, allows to achieve stronger identification. And there's been a, a discussion about supervisory intervention, <clears throat> especially at the bank um, asset quality whether this is the uh, AQR or uh, on-site, you know, bank inspections. Uh, and there appears to be, you know, some evidence of, of negative effects on lending, although uh, there is also evidence that, you know, this effect might not be as uh, strong as uh, we expect. So in, in, in summary, this is what the, the, main, um, the main studies related to, to, to our paper uh, are about. So, uh, let me explain a, a bit about the institutional background and the policy that we're looking at. So this is the, the ECB's NPL provisioning expectations. Uh, as I said, they were introduced following the sovereign uh, debt crisis. And, you know, once, uh, you know, the authorities realized that the, uh, the you know, the average of uh, NPLs in many banks, especially for, for uh, uh, banks that operate in the periphery was, you know, Above, um, um, above the, the expected levels. And the idea behind this policy intervention was to, uh, you know, really help banks, first of all, to, to recognize 
bad loans, resolve the, this problem you know, from, from the balance sheet, fix their balance sheet, and, and try to provide some transparency about what ECB thinks uh, in terms of the, the treatment of non-performing loans. So the policy itself took place in March 2018. The key characteristic of the policy, the, the, key, the, the key detail, it actually affects the, the time that a loan has remained as non-performing. As non, as non that is the vintage. But it also affects, the, the, it also speaks directly to the collateral, whether a loan is collateralized or not. Therefore, all unsecured NPLs should be fully provisioned after, se after seven years, uh, uh, where unsecured NPLs should be fully provisioned in two years after being uh, you know, in an NPL status. And all banks had to, you know, to comply, especially those with a larger share of NPL. That was, you know, above the 5%, which was the average of NPLs in, in Europe. This exercise is particularly relevant for Spain for two main reasons. A, that uh, the, the, the NPL ratio in Spain was about 9% compared to the average of 5% in the aftermath of the sovereign debt crisis. But most importantly, the details, the criteria on the in the provisioning guidelines were largely unanticipated by the banks. We can argue that, you know, there was a consultation between banks and the authorities before the introduction of the policy. However, the, the small details and the specific detail about the vintage of the loan uh, was uh, very much unexpected. And we saw some evidence that there is, uh, you know, negative abnormal returns for the Spanish bank stocks around the announcement of the ECB policy. So there appears to be uh, evidence that at least the markets were caught in, uh, in, in a surprise. The data that we use uh, are fairly standard for this type of analysis. So it's credit registry from Spain matched with the company data. Um, the, 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 the NPL, the definition of NPL is in line with the literature and with uh, uh, a, a regulatory, uh, um, uh, and the, the, how the regulators define NPLs, and in particular, it refers to loans which are more than 90 days past due. And, and using this um, rich data, uh, we start with the, 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 the first model in order to understand whether the introduction of the policy does affect the, the disposal rate. So in this, mo in, in this, in this uh, uh, model for, for NPL disposal, we look at the dummy of uh, whether a bank disposes or not a non-performing loan in the next quarter. Uh, we are using five quarters before and after the introduction, the, the release of the policy. And, and the post dummy here is the post-2018 uh, post Q1, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the, the aftermath of the policy. And the vintage refers to the log of one plus the number of months that the loan is in default. So this is the key characteristic that we identify from the policy itself. itself. We, we also include a number of, uh, of fixed effects, and I will go straight to a summary of the results, which is basically that banks are more likely to dispose of uh, uh, older NPLs following the introduction of the policy. Indeed, we find that you know, if there is a 1% increase in months, that leads to a probability of disposal of about, an increase in probability of about 1.5 percentage points. And, and if I can ask uh, um, to click on the table link, please, that would uh, take me. The first one, please. Yes, thank you. That would, uh, that would be our, uh, our first specification uh, where we, as you can see, where we, we look at the interaction between the policy and, and the vintage. And as we saturate the model with uh, uh, fixed effects, especially when we add the firm bank fixed effects, we find that after the policy, after the introduction of the policy change, for banks with older vintage, the probability to dispose, to dispose lo loans was higher. And if you take the sum of the, of, of the two coefficients, we find that in the aftermath of the policy, this, um, this probability increases to about 3.2 percentage points. Uh, if we can go back to the slides, please, thank you very much. So we do, we do uh, conduct a number of robustness tests uh, in the paper. I'll, I'll skip those, those tests here. Uh, I will just show you uh, a little bit about the, the parallel trends. Um, one concern that we, uh, you know, that we had when we were looking at this uh, data is whether banks were kind of, you know, disposing uh, bad loans before the introduction of the policy, whether it was some, you know, pre-trends going on. This appears not to be the case 
uh, when we do an analysis where we replace essentially the post dummy with, uh, with different uh, uh, time dummies. So we, you know, this is further evidence, you know, uh, in favor of the, of, the, of the approach that we take. Um, we also check whether the, the results that we obtained so far uh, are the same for all banks. And as I said, it's, it's, it, this is not the case. The, 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 the effects are not proportional, and if anything, the more profitable banks uh, complement, you know, their ability to dispose of NPLs. So this, there, there appears to be, therefore, bank-level bank heterogeneity. Uh, taking, uh, I'd like to take you now to the second model where we look at the credit supply effects. So here, again, the, the model that we present is, is, is a very similar model in, in spirit to, co to, to, to what other models have been presenting today by, uh, by colleagues. And uh, we are interested mainly in the interaction between the policy dummy, the, 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 the 2018 Q1, and the NPL vintage, where the NPL vintage essentially is, um, is a weighted average of the times the, the outstanding credit, and that allows us to, to test whether banks that are more exposed to the policy, banks that are, you know, have older vintages, they tend to cut credit more compared to other banks. We also look at the um, probability to, you know, to, to extend new credit, terminate relationships, lending relationships, and increase uh, collateral. Um, what we find is, uh, as expected, that banks with higher levels of vintage tighten more their lending standards. Uh, in, in, in fact, the results are, you know, economically important as well, and, and we find all uh, collateral uh, tends to go up following, following the introduction of, of the policy, uh, and, and so is the, the probability to terminate a bank um, relationship. So the conclusion that we draw from, the, from this test is that more exposed banks are forced to recognize these loans, uh, they increase the disposal, and therefore uh, this, you know, creates a pressure to their lending capacity. Again, we, we, we conduct the, the same, you know, test for the parallel trends. And let me go to the final set of results where uh, we look at the firm level outcomes. So here we, um, we, we take the analysis at the firm level, that is we look at growth rates between 2017 and 2019. This is a year before and a year after the introduction of the policy. And we create a weighted average of the NPL vintage at the firm level before the, before the introduction of the policy, where we weight all NPL vintages uh, using all loans from the, from the portfolio. And we want to examine whether uh, uh, companies that rely on banks that have higher uh, uh, vintages, they experience uh, a drop in their, in, their, in their firm level outcomes. And what we show is that there is a reduction in the growth rate of bank debt that mirrors the, the result that we have seen so far from the uh, bank level analysis. Um, but, you know, more, most, most importantly, we also find that uh, uh, more exposed firms, that is a one standard deviation increase in the weighted NPL uh, 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 vintage, experience uh, about 0.7% lower em uh, employment growth. Um, we find also other effects for, you know, negative effects for sales uh, uh, and assets. So overall, there is a reduction in, in, in the, in the, there is, there is a reduction in the, in the activities of the firm, the firm level activities. And once again, the effect is stronger for the risky firms. Um, I have a table of, of results. If I can please go to the first link very quickly. So that would, that would take us to the firm level outcomes where, as you can see, we observe um, significant effects for all firm level outcomes. And as I explained, the effects are not only uh, economically import, uh, statistically significant, but also economically important. I will, um, uh, if I can go back to the slides, please, and I will use the last, uh, the last minute of my talk to uh, wrap up and summarize the, uh, the main findings. We, we set out to, uh, to examine the release of the um, ECB um, NPL provisioning expectations in 2019, and we wanted to, 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 to see how this, uh, the introduction of this policy uh, uh, change had an effect on the dynamics of NPLs, the, the bank lending, and finally the firm dynamics. First of all, we find that the uh, supervisory uh, measures do trigger a reduction in NPLs, 
And if anything, there is a faster NPL disposal for banks with better fundamentals, which is of great interest. Uh, the second main finding is that banks with older vintage, they, they reduce lending in the aftermath of the policy. Uh, of course, there are banks uh, that they can smooth out this, this shock, and these are the, the banks which, you know, they, they have better uh, uh, bank characteristics. And, and finally, uh, we find that there are firms, when firms are exposed to older vintage banks, for these firms, we observe negative firm level outcomes. So a policy uh, conclusion that we may draw in this study is that banks can sometimes be myopic and they might you know, decide to keep NPLs on their balance sheets. However, against this backdrop, in this paper, we document that uh, supervi supervisory insight is actually very critical to repair balance sheet and therefore um, um, you know, increase the potential for, for you know, the overall economy and for uh, uh, firms in, in particular. So thanks very much for your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye, Fonella. Okay. I would say last but not the least. Definitely not the uh, least. So Brunella Bruno from Bocconi University. Okay, just to check whether this works. So the title is different because I received uh, uh, an updated version of the paper with a new title. And, um, okay, a little bit on the motivation, uh, the research question and the main results of the paper. Uh, so clearly the paper was motivated by the um, um, increase of non-performing loans at European banks since the global financial crisis and the Euro sovereign crisis. I just want to uh, remind a couple of numbers. I remember that so the peak of MPLS reached uh, like uh, over 1 trillion euros in 2015, 2017, 2016. Um, and I am from Italy. One third of this was held by Italian banks. Um, uh, what else? So, so since that time onwards, the policymakers and the banking authorities paid a lot of attention in order to introduce a comprehensive measure to help the banks to cope with, with the high MPLS. Um, and among these measures, uh, the one that is at the core of the paper is the addendum uh, to the MPL guidance that was introduced in March 2018 by the ECB to basically provide the quantitative uh, um, a quantitative instruction on how banks should uh, um, provision non-performing loans. So this was called, this was an MS calendar provisioning. And the idea was to, to enable um, uh, banks to um, cover, fully cover the non-performing loans in a more timely way by either uh, with making a distinction between secured and unsecured loans, as we will see. Uh, later on. So what they, the, the authors do is basically exploit this uh, exercise in order to see whether um, banks after the policy um, in fact increase their propensity to dispose MPLS, um, uh, either reduce or increase the lending and uh, um, also by looking at the real effects of, of the measure. Uh, general comments, this is a nice paper on a topic that I like it a lot. I've been working on MPLS for a long time now. Uh, and what it is so good is that they, in fact, exploit as a quasi-natural experiment this um, addendum on loan loss provisioning that is something relatively new in this uh, piece of, in this strand of literature. They also um, rely on a large set of granular data to the different levels, loan level, bank level, and bank firm level, so which is good. Uh, so my comments will be more about um, the storytelling and certain dynamics and on mechanism that uh, to me are not sufficiently emphasized within the paper uh, that, that I consider critical in uh, uh, in this framework, and this is what I would uh, will uh, try to do. Um, so basically, what it is a key in their identification strategies is the concept of MPL vintage, which is uh, the length of time an MPL is recognized as a such, and this is their measure of exposure to the policy shock. 
uh, exposure at both the law level and the, um, the bank level, where basically more exposed loans are older, so are um, low MPL with older, with, with greater vintage. And what they find is that um, older loans are more likely to be sold by banks. Uh, it's a measure of identification of bank exposure. That's they use so this weighted average MPL vintage to measure the exposure of banks. Uh, where And what they find is that more exposed banks are those that reduce credit the most, especially to riskier borrowers. And so, so this is key to them. But my point is that there might be something uh, over and beyond MPL vintage. And I would be fully convinced that what they find is driven by MPL and MPL vintage, not by other factors that are relevant in, uh, in this uh, context. And why I'm seeing this? this because uh, they examine, in a sense, the short-term effect of uh, the addendum of, the, say, of this uh, um, measure, uh, because they look at, the, say, their post is five quarters after the measure. And uh, also, this measure was at the beginning, at least, uh, addressed to newly um, to new MPLS. That is MPLS. So that is loans recognized in MPLS a month after the measure, and it takes time for an MPLS, you know, to become old. And also, we know that disposing MPLS is costly for banks, and it's costly in two manner: either banks' provision to stick to the schedule that was introduced in the measure, and the banks may provision where if they generate sufficient, say, revenues, or if they do not want to provision, they take the loss that depends on the coverage ratio of the loan at the moment. The higher the coverage loss, the lower the loss the bank, the bank can take by disposing the loan, and so the lower the impact of uh, on, on bank capital, but the law, and by Swiss, of course. And why I'm saying this? Because we need to understand where these, you know, elements are in in this uh, in this context. And so my main comments are about. There are three main comments actually. So the very first one is uh, the paper show us tell us uh, that the the the, the measure is a shock to provisioning, but in the end, this is only, only said like in a qualitative way, we do not see how the provisioning dynamics change after the policy shock. We only look, so they only look at the um, probability for a bank to dispose MPL. I would like to see something about MPL provisioning after the policy shock, because in fact, this is a shock to put to loan loss provision. Second, what they do is to look at the propensity of banks to dispose MPLS after the policy. So they look at the extensive margin, but I would like to know more about the intensive margin. So in the end, how much this, do, did this bank um, dispose? How was, what was the magnitude of, of the measure, which is important to understand the actual impact of of the measure on bank balance sheet and through this on bank lending. Um, and then, which other characteristics, factors may affect uh, the results? And uh, this, uh, and I'm saying this because in principle, the authors may rely, or, uh, may rely on a very granular data set at the loan level, at the bank level, but they, my, my feeling is that they do not exploit this granularity in a sufficient uh, uh, manner. For instance, I see from the statistics, from the summary statistics, that 75% on average of loans are unsecured. And according to the, the document, the, the addendum, uh, uh, there, are, there might be potential say, large differences whether MPLS are secure or unsecured in terms of ability for a bank to dispose the loans. Also, you have, uh, as far as I understand, the information about the number of days these MPLS are, are, are past due. And this is important because this could allow, could enable you to see in the end within the MPL portfolio, what's the, which are the subcategories. And this is again important because it's much easier to say dispose 
trust the due loans vis-a-vis -vis bad loans which are much riskier, more costly to dispose and so on and so forth. Uh, same for uh, bank level. The measure was addressed to significant institutions. I have only one minute, but we do not see, I don't see how many significant institutions are, are sample, for instance, and then other, say, uh, bank specific uh, factors that are important to understand uh, the mechanism. Okay, I've only one minute, I skip this, and I just want to focus on the role of bank characteristics. So to me, what is it truly crucial to understand either the propensity of disposing NPLS and then impact on bank lending that to go through the effect of the measure uh, on bank balance sheet and the report on bank lending is to understand what's the role played by profitability as you do, capitalization and coverage durations. Because uh, banks teach that by high capital level or high coverage durations are in a better position to dispose loan and so are less exposed to the measure independently on the vintage of their NPLS portfolio. And you carry out this exercise, but to me this don't address my points because at first I did not understand whether these interactions are continuous variable or are the level in the pre-policy period. You should be more precise on this, but what I would like to see here is an interaction with, say, low profitable banks, uh, low capital banks, high MPL banks, low coverage ratio banks, in order to exploit this generating a more clear uh, manner. Um, sorry, if you speak, yeah. could you speak no, sorry. close to the microphone? No, sorry, sorry, yeah, yes, you know that I'm very tired at the end of the day, so sorry. Hope you have heard something. And uh, so again, about the capitalization, what it is important is uh, to look not at the capital to total asset ratio, but at the regulatory capital ratios, because MPLS have a double impact. They have an effect on the numerator and the denominator. So you do not see that the capitalization matter, but to me, capital channel is there. I, I mean, I don't see it in your numbers, but you should be certain that this is not, you, I mean, uh, owed to the measure that you have used. So you, at some point comments on zombie landing, I would be more careful in, under, in, in claiming that your results speak to the zombie landing literature. We have seen that it is a complicated matter and okay, the, basically that's all, I have no more time, so thank you. Thank you very much, Bonetta. All good and I, I understood that everyone heard you well, even yeah. on WebEx, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have a few more minutes to take further questions. If there's still some energy in the room. Um, yes, Diana, and then um, again. Thank you. So, I mean, you, you explored a bit heterogeneity across banks in terms of profitability, uh, but I wonder if there's another dimension to consider. So as, as far as I can remember, I think that the, the Spanish banks, I, I, Kafka probably knows this much better, so, so they were able to sell a large proportion of non-performing loans coming from the crisis. And so I, there was this asset management vehicle that was created and, and many banks sold a very significant volume of loans back then. So I wonder if, I, I mean, when you go to 2018, I wonder if there's still some heterogeneity coming from the banks that were perhaps not so easily able to, to sell these past uh, overdue loans and some of them could still be in their balance sheets. Great paper. So I just wonder who would be the buyer of those NPLs after the bank sell, and I also wonder the way to essentially make this NPL exit from the bank balance sheet. Is there any way that banks, instead of selling away, could they also consider like um, renegotiate with their borrowers? Because I think you have part of your analysis at the loan level or firm information. So let's say if after the firm essentially defaulted and the loan be became be, become non-performing, could they then still modify to make it essentially back to the kind of better loans? We have one more. 
uh, thank you, um, David Zhukovsky from SSM. Uh, great paper indeed. Um, Spain is one of the jurisdictions where you have foreclosed assets framework, um, which I think fall into the uh, definition of the NPL. So I was wondering whether there is any specific reason from this perspective why in your case there is a high sensitivity of this policy. So whether you have any chance to check whether you know the ratio of uh, foreclosed assets on bank's balance sheet would also in an interactive fashion affect the sensitivity to the policy. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for the discussion, Brunel, and thank you very much for your uh, question. So le le let me start um, with uh, the questions uh, asked by the audience. So with, um, uh, with respect to um, bank heterogeneity in 2019, Diana, uh, that could be a possibility. We can definitely look into that. Um, I my understanding, and I might be wrong here, but I, I, I asked my Spanish co-authors that the secondary market for selling NPLs has not been that active. Uh, I may be wrong, but I would be more than happy to discuss that, but that's, that's my understanding. Uh, however, that could not be the case, and we can definitely explore that in more detail. Um, the, the other question about who, who buys the, the loans, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, we do not know that, so we don't we don't know who is the the buyer. Um, the the best the best we we can do is check whether there are loans that are uh, classified as NPLs, but then they you know they, they they change status. That that we can do, and I guess uh, we could we could at least you know rerun some of these analyses taking this uh, comment into account. Uh, but it is, you know, it's an inherent data, data limitation. Um, as, as for the last question um, um, regarding, we have not looked into that. We have not looked at the ratio of foreclosure assets, but we would be more than happy to do so and, uh, you know, would like to explore what the, you know, what the updated results look like, but it's, it's definitely um, uh, doable and worth exploring. Um, I will try to respond uh, briefly, um, you know, summarizing the points uh, made by the discussant. Um, yes, uh, I take the point that, you know, disposing NPLs is costly. So to me, it's, uh, it's, very, it's very important actually to show, uh, I mean, of, of the comments, the one that really strikes me is the, the idea of um, really, you know, exploring both intensive and extensive margins. So that would be very important for you know, motivating the, the paper uh, better, and that's something that can be done. Um, uh, regarding the, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the different characteristics of the banks, uh, of course, we could look at the, the, the interest coverage or, or other indicators to help us. Um, coverage ratio. The coverage ratio, yeah, we could, you know, to help us, to help us um, um, make the, the, the analysis of the bank level heterogeneity uh, uh, stronger. Um, and, and, and finally, um, I, I, I also agree about the point that you made about zombie lending. We should be uh, more careful on you know, how we frame uh, our relationship to the literature. Uh, but but we, we feel you know, that there is you know, some you know, story going on, but we have not touched upon that for sure. Uh, so thanks, thanks very much again for your discussion and thank you very much for your uh, comments and questions. And let me conclude this session by thanking the presenters and discussants also for good timekeeping.